when I when I found out that you were releasing a podcast, I had very conflicting emotions about that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, now I'm not going to be the only one. That sucks. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, I think it's fantastic. I think it's great to to get um, as much as much voice and as much uh, marketing and exposure to the birding community out there as we can. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Birding Today podcast, where birders come together to discuss the joy of birding. I'm your host, Guillaume Durig. Hope everyone's well out there. It's really raining down hard here in, in Coffs Harbour at time of recording. Um, as, as you might know, the, the, the floods have been pretty bad up here in this way, but hopefully, hopefully by the time this episode comes out, it'll have subsided. Um, so let's get into this episode. I'm very excited for this one um, because today's guest is a birder, podcaster and full-time birding guide who has birded extensively across Australia as well as overseas in six different countries. Seven, if you count four species seen through the windows of Dubai Airport. Love it. He grew up on a farm in the mid-north of South Australia as the eldest of six kids and had a brilliant childhood. In his first 18 years of life, his family owned a farm, two music shops, a sheep station in New South Wales, and lived in China for a year. Before becoming a full-time birding guide, he worked extensively as a chef, notably at Southern Ocean Lodge on Kangaroo Island, and as head chef at River Valley Lodge in New Zealand, before getting his first executive chef job at the age of 22 at Wild Waters Lodge in Uganda. The birding must have been amazing there. After that, he returned home to work on the family farm, where he spent almost nine years. In early 2019, he was given the opportunity to work for Bellbird Tours, and has been leading tours ever since then. He started the Birder's Guide podcast in May 2020, after looking for an Australian birding podcast and not being able to find one, and has recently released his 50th episode. So please welcome Michael Greenshields on the show. How are you doing, Michael? Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. It's interesting being on the other end of the microphone. This is my first official interview, so looking forward to it. Fantastic. Absolutely. I, I am too. And, and I think this is going to be an interesting episode also for our listeners to get maybe an inside look at how podcasting works, the, maybe the challenges and the joys of podcasting and, and, and how, how maybe any of our listeners could start a podcast about birding. Um, but before we get into all that, um, what aspect of birding brings you the most joy, Michael? So for me, um, I, I'm the sort of person who likes a challenge. Um, so for me, the bit that I like about birding is the fact that... Um, so there's a, there's a quote, which I think sums it up. I'll see if I can pull it up because I will... Um, it's on my Facebook banner for my podcast, so I'll be able to find it quick. Um, so I interviewed Bruce Richardson, who you've also had on the show, um, and he he might have mentioned this quote on yours, but um, it's a quote about fishing, but if you change the word fishing to birding, it says, the charm of birding is that it is the pursuit of what is elusive but attainable, a perpetual series of occasions for hope. So for me, birding is the fact that I can go anywhere and there's the, the possibility of seeing something I've never seen before. So, I mean, I've seen wedge-tailed eagles before, but so I'm sitting in my office. I can look out on our backyard at the moment where it's beautiful and sunny and warm. It's not raining here. Um, and so yesterday I was in my office and a pair of wedge-tailed eagles flew over probably 100 metres away. First time I've seen them here. So, you know, you just, you just never know what you're going to find. Um, and that for me is what it is. I, I used to say that I enjoyed the hunt, which I do. Um, but my cousin, who's not a birder, but his um, dad and brother are birders. He's like, look, mate, he's like, it's not a hunt. <laughs> it's like, unless you're like chasing down this bird with like the decapitated head of its own mother. It's really not a hunt. <laughs> it's just. You're just out there looking for birds. So anyway, absolutely. I mean, there's there's different types of birding too. Like, and 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 I would I would say that there are people who are that motivated and driven 
Like there are birders who who really go to great lengths to to chase birds. I think for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not, I wouldn't uh, classify myself as a twitcher, but that probably is just because I'm too poor to be a twitcher. Um, <laughs> I feel if, yeah. I, if I had more money, I probably would be to be honest. But yeah, I I like um, I enjoy listing, as in like having a life list. I enjoy seeing new things. So that for me is what brings me the most excitement, I guess. Absolutely, yeah, 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 and th and there's there's lots of themes running through that as well. Like um, like I mentioned, different types of birding, and 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 that's different wherever you are as well. And and you grew up in a very special place for birds, like the the, the mid north of South Australia. Like that just like it sounds so exotic. I think even maybe to, <laughs> uh, even even maybe to, to 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 people on the coast, you know. Like tell me about how you got into birds. Uh, you know, in that environment, or or, or, or did, like because I know that you were quite young, but how, how did it happen exactly? Yeah, so I guess um, I, I've mm, I'll get into that in a minute. But so my grandfather, uh, my mum's dad, he has always been into conservation and birding. He actually in 2010, I think, got an Order of Australia medal for conservation. So he's quite into it. Um, he was probably my biggest influence. Uh, I've always enjoyed nature. I've always liked being outside. I've always, you know, like looking at insects and mammals and trees and anything that is out there, basically. Um, so whenever we were over at his place uh, as little kids, we would always be out bushwalking or, you know, down at the local duck pond looking at birds and that sort of stuff. So I didn't uh, necessarily take up birding during those years, but he was probably a big he fostered my interest in nature a lot um and then sorry my headphones fallen off my head um and then i got into birding on july 7th 2007 uh which is very precise so i was at my cousin's house so um the cousin who told me i don't hunt birds his brother um had just taken up birding and I was at his house for some reason and he's like, look, I'm going to the local wetlands, which was Greenfield Wetlands for anyone in Adelaide who knows Greenfield Wetlands. Um, do you want to come along? And I said, yeah, sure. I'm not doing anything else. So we uh, went down there and we saw a black-fronted dotrel and it was, uh, like it was doing a display trying to distract us from its nest, essentially. And... You know, I was just totally engrossed in this whole because we had we'd taken his dad's binoculars and I was just totally engrossed in this bird that 10 seconds ago would have just been this boring little brown thing on the, <laughs> you know, on the ground that now was like it was like intricately detailed. It had a whole personality and purpose that we had never seen before. And so we, we went back to his house uh, we, I bought a notebook, I think probably on the way back. Uh, we stopped off, bought a notebook for our records. The next day we went out birding again and never really looked back. Um, and we've done, we've done some big trips together. I think two years after we'd, been, we'd started birding, we did a big trip from like Adelaide to Burke to Mount Isa to uh, what's up on the coast? Um, I want to say Columbaroo, but that's the wrong wrong side of Australia. Corumba, and then Cairns, and then down to Lamington, and then back to Adelaide. So, um, yeah, I don't know. We just we just got fully into it. Um, yeah, so that's that's how we got into it. Fantastic. That's I think I'm trying to think, and I'm pretty sure that you're you're the first guest that has given me a, a date to when they started birding. <laughs> yeah. That's that's epic. That's that that must be really kind of. Um, it must be a special thing to have kind of, you know, a date that you can remember and say, I remember that day I got into birding. Fantastic. Really cool. Yeah, I think it's probably the most precise I've heard of, of anybody getting into birding and not just gradually falling into it. But um, as I said, I've always been interested in nature, uh, but that was when it properly took off. Just, just before we get into the next the next section, I'm interested in... Because the mid north of New of um, of uh, South Australia is is quite an arid environment, is that right? Was the farm in in an arid environment, or yeah? So we've got 
how are you with rainfall totals? So our rainfall total is like 450 mil a year. So that's, um, it's not arid, uh, but it's not, it's not lush by any right. means. Um, how would you describe where we are? So I live, I guess, in the Adelaide Plains is the area. So it's very flat. Um, we do have some hills on our farm, but it's very flat. It's very agricultural. Uh, we have the coast near Port Wakefield, um, it's about 30 kilometers away, I think, something like that. Right. So we are we are near the coast, um, but not it's not the same as uh, New South Wales, you know, that sort of coastline. Um, but yeah, I guess the area that we are is probably best known for waders, I would say, which is probably not what you would think. Um, so we had a actually went out birding. On the weekend, a couple of days ago, uh, looking for a broadbill sandpiper, which had turned up, uh, which we got onto. Um, but yeah, so uh, our, our birding is, I wouldn't say people would come here to go birding. Right. Um, but we said, I mean, we certainly do have birds around here. We get the occasional eruption of crimson chats and every now and then orange chats. But mostly, mostly waders are probably what we're well known for, right? On right, a very yeah. small, on a very small little section of coast. Absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And South Australia is interesting because um, I, I've never been there birding, but um, I'd I'd love to go there. Is, I, I understand it's quite good for rock parrot that to, that down yeah. near the yeah, yeah, good for rock parrots. Not not near us, but within you know, a couple of hours drive, you can get them easily. Yeah. Enough. Yeah. That's cool. That's that's a target bird for me for sure. So we'll have to we'll have to connect <laughs> later down the line for sure. Um, and so, with all that said, um, yes. we're having this conversation via a podcast, and people are listening or watching. And I want to talk to you about 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 podcasting. Let's let's get into podcasting because we're both podcasters, and we both we both love podcasting, and and we do it for for for, for our own joy and and because we see value in it. What do you think? Yep. What do you think uh, podcasting is all about? Like, the, why is it why is it a good idea to 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 listen to podcasts and, and and produce podcasts? What is it about them that makes them unique? You think? Um, I think the fact that it's an. I think that has two factors. I'm sorry if all my kids are home currently. I, I apologize <laughs> if you can hear them bashing around in the background there. Um. I think there's two two sections to that. Number one is podcasts don't have to be a visual thing. They can be. Can you hear that crying in the background? <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Someone just fell off of something. Um, it doesn't have to be a visual thing. So you can upload them to YouTube if you want to. That's, that's fine. But it doesn't have to be visual. So you don't have to be paying attention um, directly. Uh, you can be... So I've got... Um, I know of one listener who I have who's also been on on a tour with me. Hi, Linda, if you're listening. Um, she listens when she's out running. That's that's when she listens to it. Um, but then at the same time, podcasts give you the time to have an a in-depth conversation. So, and not not everybody likes to read. So, you could we could put out a transcript of this conversation, but not everybody's going to sit down and read through however long this is all of the however many words that takes up um and you can you can listen to it anyway you can listen to it while you're driving while you're sitting at home just eating dinner um and i think the main benefit is mm, no so two more things um i think the fact that you can listen to someone tell their own story in their own words and their own voice makes a difference um so i've had um I had someone on my show who I will, I'm going to talk about later on in the podcast, but he, if you listen to, say, uh, say he recorded his podcast and we typed it out and got someone else to read it, it wouldn't even be close to the same impact mm -hmm. as he could have talking about it himself. So I think listening to someone's story in their own voice makes a difference. Um, and then the other main impact really is the fact that you can fit a lot of information into 45 minutes, 60 minutes. Some of the 
podcasts I've done have gone like 90 minutes long. You can fit a lot of information in an hour and a half of talking. So I think those are the the benefits of a podcast versus other mediums. Would you agree? Yeah, no, for sure. And it's interesting you touch on on, on people's voice. That's a really good point because because with, with, with someone talking or with two people having a conversation, there isn't just the words. You have the intonations mm. and, and yep. the volume and, and the emotions that come through with the voice. And, and that's, I think, a really good selling point, if you will, of, of podcasts, yep. which is, and you, and you get dynamics, you know, and, and it's, it's like listening, it's like being in a cafe and listening to two people, you know, eavesdropping on someone's conversation, but, it, yep. but, but it's, it's produced for that. And, and that's, that's a really good point that you touch on with, with, with the vocal aspect of podcasts. And, and also, as you say, listening wherever. I often listen to podcasts while I wash the dishes, actually. I've got my headphones oh, on. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, and, uh, and, and, and it just makes... And, it's, and, and the other point you touched on is attention. It's, it doesn't require your full attention because, yeah. it's, because it's only tapping... When you're only listening to a podcast, it's only tapping into one of your senses, hearing. And maybe that's why people like podcasts, because it's, it's, it's a way to consume information by, you know, but you can also do other things at the same time. And, and yeah, I, th I think, I think it's just wonderful. And I, and I'm so happy that I started doing a podcast because it's, because even like as a host, and you would know this, it's, it's really fulfilling and rewarding, isn't it? Um, to, yeah. to, to, yeah. to, to create something like this, especially given that it, it lacks so much in Australia, which is another point we can touch on now, if you want, what, 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 what prompted you to, to, to start the Birders Guide because it was the first Australian birding podcast, which is so exciting. Tell me about how you first started and 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 the lack of Australian birding podcasts. Um, I'm sorry about my kids. <laughs> they're, they're leaving the house in ten minutes, so that'll be fun. They probably just touched each other's drink or something. Um, so yeah, so I um. I, I have listened previously to starting my own podcast. I listened to um, The Birding Life or This Birding Life, can't remember, South African podcast. Um, and I also listened to the ABA, American Birding Association podcast. Right. Um, and so I, I was familiar with birding podcasts and I personally really liked the medium. I liked the fact that I could drive to, you know, Adelaide for an hour and a half and and spend most of that time learning something. Um and I, I started looking for Australian ones, couldn't find any. I, was, I wasn't looking particularly hard just every now and then when I thought about it, I'd give it a quick Google. Um, and I came, across one, I came across one podcast that had like six episodes. It was just like a ABC special or something like that. Um, so I listened to that, which was quite interesting. But that was about all. And I, I searched and searched and searched. Um, I think there are some... There's a couple of other ones that have come out since, and I think they might have came out at almost exactly the same time that I started mine. Um, but one of them, uh, or oh, I can't remember what it's called, maybe Birdcast, I think. Uh, so that that's not specifically targeted always at wild birds. They do a lot of, like, aviary stuff as well. Um, so I, ju I just didn't find anything that was essentially what I would want to listen to. Right. Um, so... I thought about it for a couple of weeks and thought, well, you know, if no one else is doing it, maybe I can do it. So I did, you know, I just did a whole bunch of research, huge amounts of research, listened to, I'm jumping ahead to other things, which I will talk about later on. So hopefully that doesn't throw us out. But um, yeah, I just did a huge amount of research, listened to podcasts, listened to birding podcasts, took notes on what I liked and what I didn't like, um, listened to non-birding podcasts and made those same things. So one of my favourite podcasts outside of birding is uh, it's by Jordan Harbinger. I think I think it's just the Jordan Harbinger show. I think he's sort of like a he's a lesser well known um, Joe Rogan essentially. He just right. interviews people um, and and fascinating people. But I would listen to that, and he does some things on his podcast, which I was like, oh, that really just annoys me. <laughs> like he, what he talks. Like he talks too much. He will like he will give an opinion on something that his guests are saying and then talk for like five minutes. I'm like, I'm not here to listen to you. I'm here to listen to 
this other person. Anyway, so you can you can find information like that anywhere. It doesn't have to just be burning podcasts. So did a whole bunch of research, researched what equipment I needed and how to do it and all this sort of stuff and uh, just started, basically. Mm-hmm. So it essentially just came out of the fact that I couldn't find anything that I wanted to listen to that was Australian-focused. It's really a great kind of story, you know. It's like, oh, I'll do it myself, you know. That it's really kind of a good, a, a good story to tell about about podcasting because podcasting can can be about anything. One of my favorite yeah. podcasts is um is non birding is um it's called um the James Bond A to Z podcast. You might see my James Bond poster over there. I mm-hmm. love. I'm a, I'm a big Bond fan. Love James Bond, and and you know. Podcasts can be about anything. They can be about brooding, mm. about James Bond, you know, about uh, about general culture that's happening, plants, uh, uh, you know, fashion, music, and and so th- there's something there for everyone. But there is there is I think there are some topics and some hobbies that are less uh, promoted via podcasts, and and brooding is one of them. I think so. Yeah. So what is it about brooding that that that, that that translates to a lack of podcasts, do you think? Is it because we're all too busy out birding to do podcasting? <laughs> Something like that? <laughs> I think... Um, I think, in my honest opinion, it is because people just don't see bird watching as a big enough market. So um, let, me, let me, for our listeners, let me give a, an example of that. So... Um, and so before I do that, just a caveat, anytime I talk about my podcast, I'm not trying to compare it to yours. It's just, that's the stat, stats and the statistics that I am aware of. Um, so if you want to make money podcasting, the, the general consensus is that you, you get paid in, um, per thousand listens. That's the general way you get paid. So you get, um, if you get less, I think it's like on average, if you get less than 10,000 listens per episode, you earn $12 per thousand listens or something like that. So for me, my number one downloaded episode, which is by Nicholas Haas, we did an episode on splits and lumps in taxonomy. Yeah. Um, that episode is nearly at a thousand listens. It's like 975 or something. So even my best episode, not enough to make any money on whatsoever commercially. Wow. So yeah. So in terms of in terms of making money, birding podcasts aren't I, I saw that you have a um Patreon or a one yeah. of those things. I just recently launched it, yeah. 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 So there are ways to do it, but just commercially through advertising and stuff like that, it's just, just not feasible. There's not a big enough market. So you have to be able to do it purely and simply for your own um, interest and love of the fact that you're doing it. Um, and so I, um, uh, another thing, I was doing some research the other day because uh, I'm looking at doing some some proper research into the birding tourism market in Australia, which hopefully comes off the ground. So I was looking into some research in that, and they said that one of the biggest problems that commercial tour operators face in Australia is the fact that nobody sees bird watching as a like a viable market. There's just not enough people involved to make anything of it. So I think that's a little bit it's semi-related, but um, I think our biggest problem is that birding just isn't seen to be big enough to be worthwhile. That's what I think. Right. Yes. Which I don't think yeah. is true, uh, but that's the that's the general consensus. Well, absolutely, but but, but paradoxically, it doesn't mean that you know birding podcasts. <laughs> necessarily come from a love of birds because they're not viable to as a, as a financial yeah. operation. So, so yeah. 
the reason someone would start a birding podcast principally would be love of birds. And, yeah. and, and that would lead to a good podcast because it's driven by passion. See what yeah. I mean? Yeah. 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 hundred percent. And I think, uh, yeah, I think you're right in that. And I think that's a good thing. Um, if I was, or if either of us were commercially driven, we would do things very differently. Absolutely. So, um, I think I think it has its its benefits, but then you need people who are willing to do that. You need people who are willing to put in, you know, however long it takes um, to to produce a podcast for no return benefit really at all. Um, so my um, my advice to your listeners. So I don't have a uh, I don't have a Patreon page or anything like that. But my advice to your listeners are to to subscribe to yours <laughs> i just put that plug in there oh well that's really nice and 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 i mean we both we both we both have similar podcasts but they're, they're quite different as well i think in in little mm. ways and that's good yes. because it's good to have variety between between different um di different products and different podcasts and and it offers listeners um you know choice and options and and different viewpoints which is really good too and but that's not to say that um, the joy of the joy of podcasting that that we know so much about um, is is, uh, is is challenge free. So so tell mm. me a bit about um, the pros and the cons, the challenges and and all all that's involved in making a podcast. We'll start with the challenges. What what what's what's challenging about making a birding podcast in your experience? Um, do you have a time limit on this conversation? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, I think that I think the challenges change over time as you get into it. So I think for me, the, the challenge when you start is being getting the balance right between good quality and as in good quality hardware and being able to af afford it um, and then finding the time. So for me, I don't know. How many, pod how many episodes have you released now? Um, 20? As of, as of today, 20, yeah. T two seasons of yeah. 10 episodes, 20, yeah. Yeah. So for me, probably the first maybe eight episodes, eight or 10 episodes, I put in way more effort than I do now. And that's not because I care less now. That's just because I've done 40 more episodes and I'm just quicker at it. But when I first started, I would probably find, it would probably take me like two hours to find a guest in terms of like just scrolling through Facebook or recent research papers and just finding someone that I thought people would be interested in listening to. Um, and then you'd have to chase them down and see if they're interested. And then it would take you, it would take me probably five or six hours to research their stuff. I would read. Um, so for example, uh, Hugh McGregor, who I had on, I think he was, he might've been my last one or the second to last one, um, I read his PhD thesis from top to bottom and then I read wow. other stuff that he was involved in and read other papers to see if what he said was contradicted by other things. So, you know, that would take me like five or six hours to do that and then an hour doing the podcast and then probably a couple of hours editing it and publishing it. So for me, at least for the first, let's say, 10, um, you know, it would take me like a good 12 14 hours to get an episode out. Um, so the first challenge is finding the time. Absolutely. Um, especially if you have a full-time job. Do you have a full-time job? Just out of at, curiosity. At the moment, I'm just between jobs. And actually, I'll, I'll choose this moment to reveal to, to, to my listeners that um, I'm moving to Cairns tomorrow. I'm relocating to Cairns for work. So I've found work up there. So uh, that's exciting. And uh, there'll, there'll definitely be more content coming up, uh, which is more Cairns related and maybe Cairns related guests in the future. So, but yes, to answer your question, I'm just, just between jobs um, at the moment and starting work uh, in a couple of weeks up there. So, but, 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 about that, about the time, the time is the challenge, absolutely. And I think it's fair to say that there's far more work that goes into a podcast than people suppose there is. Would you agree? Yeah. 100%. <laughs> so, yeah, so the time, the time is probably the first challenge. Um, and then the challenge is finding people who are willing to be on the show. Um, although that's not as much of a challenge as you think, I think I've probably asked two people who have said no. Um Pretty much everybody I've asked, and I've probably got 15 people uh, lined up in my emails to to still get to. Yeah, same. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, for me, I've got 
Um, I've got four kids, four under five and a half. So my life is busy. I'm on like five different boards around town. So I, for me to find time that someone else is also available, yeah, yeah, um, take is is hard work. And then you want to get someone who is going to be interesting to people to listen to. Um, luckily, I haven't interviewed anybody and had to say, no, nah, we're not going to release that because you're too boring. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had to do that yet. So that's good. But um, that might happen one day. Um, and what else are we talking about? So, uh, yeah, so challenging parts. So time finding people but once you once you're up and going and this is a i don't know if you've had this you might not have uh this has only happened to me in the last or probably five maybe ten episodes the hardest thing to handle i think is criticism so i don't know if you've had anybody email you or contact you criticizing your podcast or not um I, I don't really pay attention to, to that. Uh, nobody's emailed in saying that they don't like it. What, what's, what happened with your one? So, yeah, so I had, um, so first of all, I had a lady um, contact me. She sent me an email. Uh, I wrote it down here so that I wouldn't forget it. Um, so this is the opposite of criticism. Um, but my point is that this came in after the thing I'm about to talk about. So that helped out a lot. So she sent me an email saying it was very long, but the bit that, is important, says, listening to your podcast when I felt like uh, she was having a bad year. Listening to your podcast when I felt like I couldn't go on any longer has given me the strength to keep going. So, I mean, like that is the ultimate, uh, uh, what's the word? I don't even know what the word is, but that's the ultimate uncriticism. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the day before that, I had, a, I had an email from a listener I won't say his name, from a listener who emailed me in a very, like, absolute perler of an email. It was, like, all written in capital letters and uh, it was accusing me of being, like, everything that was wrong with sexism in the world and that I was, like, a despicable person for the way that I treated my guest. It was really something. And, uh, and like, to be honest, I almost quit my podcast that day. I was like so just like upset about it, um, and like I get lots of uh, I get lots of no not lots I get some constructive criticism, like uh, I get people email me and say things like stop defending your audio quality, like we don't care if it's bad today, just <laughs> do your thing. So I, I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate it if people write in and say, look, I think your podcast would be better if you did X, Y, and Z. Because that's great. I because I just know it from what I do. I don't listen to it from the outside. Uh, but this was not constructive. This was just like mean. <laughs> so anyway, so um, and yeah, for me, I mean, I can take criticism. I've got pretty thick skin, but it's just like you know, I don't get anything out of this. I'm just here because I love doing it, and I want to bring some birding information into the birding space. So you don't have to listen to my podcast if you don't want to. <laughs> and I think it's part of birding, you know, I, 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 I say this often because it's good to realize that, you know, birding is, is a hobby like any other and it's a community like any other. And there's, there's negativity in, in everything, in everything human, really. So yeah. Just got to try and handle it and, and 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 keep doing keep doing it because we love it. You know, if I, th I think if, if I would ever find myself waking up thinking, oh, you know what, I really can't be bothered doing this today, you know, or I really don't have any joy in it. You know, yeah. it might be, yeah. it might be it might be hard work, and I realize it's hard work. It's like okay, I've got to set time for this, but it, but if I don't get enjoyment out of it. Um, at, you know, and, and, and I realize that it's the end product that count that counts. I'm, yeah. I, I'm, quite, I'm quite producer like in that sense. I like, you know, once it's up there, it's like, OK, that's the result of the work and it's there. It's tangible. And and that's a big part of it. And that's a, 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 a pro for me. Like it's, it's, the, it's one of the best parts and, and meeting guests um, and, and discussing a passion together with, with other people that share your passion 
there's there's almost nothing better than that. Like, and and, and you yeah. speak this, this yeah. speak the same language. You know, when you talk about LGAs, listing, twitching, uh, you know, there's all this vocabulary that's quite niche, and that and you can share that with with people via podcasts, and and listeners yeah. Can, yeah. can 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 share in in that as well, and 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 they feel part of it because it's just it's just them, their headphones, and two other people in each headphone, and it's like. Yeah. It's it's really cool. So so, what do you think are the, are the best parts of podcasting in your experience? Yeah, so I, I agree with what you said. I I, I really enjoy podcasting. Um, I wouldn't do it if I didn't. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's 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 a number of things that I really really love about it. So from a personal perspective, I love to learn things. I I just Love to learn anything. Doesn't matter whether it's about birding, whether it's about um, food or gardening or physics. Doesn't matter. I'm just interested in learning stuff. So, uh, you know, when I was when I was a little kid, my favourite books were like Guinness World Records and that sort of thing. So, for me, the thing that I that well, the thing that I personally like about podcasting is what I get to learn out of it. So I get to chat to like fascinating people and like other people, other people uh, get to listen to that conversation, but, but uh, they don't get to be in the conversation and they uh, listeners. So this is not to take away from podcasting, keep listening to the podcast. <laughs> but um, if, if you're just listening to a podcast, you don't get to have the conversation at the start and at the end that aren't recorded and you, you don't get to direct the conversation to where you think would be most interesting. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, so I really enjoy that. And as I was saying before about Hugh McGregor and researching his thesis and other research papers on feral cats and stuff, um, like the amount of stuff that I learned about feral cats just on that little bit was well worth uh, the, the time and effort that went into that podcast. Um, I also really like meeting people. Um, and luckily I'm fortunate enough to have a job, uh, tour guiding that means I meet fascinating people all the time. Um, and my hobby. So, well, I guess my work and my hobby are essentially the same thing, but one I get paid for and one I don't. Um, <laughs> so I meet fascinating people on here. I meet fascinating people out birding and on tour um, so I just, yeah, I just love meeting new people, learning things, and everybody's got something to teach you if you take the time to ask them and listen. Um, and so I also really enjoy the fact that I can help listeners learn stuff as well, um, which I assume is why everybody's listening is because they're interested in learning something and seeing what's happening around. So was that the question? Was that the well, yeah, we're, I mean, we're, we're, we're discussing. What's the well, best see, part? Yeah. You, you know what? That's, that's a sign of a great conversation that you, you start thinking about other things that initially were related to the, the question, but then you, you expand on them. That's, so it's, so, so, but, but yes, so the, the positive aspects and the, and the pros and the best parts of, uh, of podcasting really does come yeah. down to that. And, and I wanted to touch on the host, uh, the host guest balance because at the beginning yeah. I was I struggled a little bit maybe with with uh, how much I had to talk and how much I had to let the guest talk. But then sometimes the guest goes on too long and then you're like, okay, I've got to butt in at some point. Um, yeah. So it's it's definitely a balance, but but in that balance there is a, a positive aspect of as the host, you learn so much and, and you know, and, and, and different personalities come on, you know, there's sometimes more colorful personalities that are kind of quite yep. happy to be on. And then you also have those, the guests which are a bit more kind of self, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A, a little bit more, uh, more measured maybe. And, and, but, but that doesn't make them any less engaging, you know? So, yep. so there's so many different sides and angles from which to view podcasting. Um, and, and, and this is, this is just great. And, and another, Another topic that we had written down was um, was I, I'm aware that you have a couple of listeners. You, you told me when we were emailing that that potentially a, a couple of emailers listening would like to start their own birding podcast. M maybe not in, not even in Australia, but if they're listening anywhere else um, in the world. So so as the host of the Birders Guide, what advice would you give to someone thinking of starting a birding podcast? 
Um, so I've got a, I've got a lot of thoughts on this. How long have we been going for, by the way? When did uh, we start? 45 we, minutes ago? 40 40, minutes yeah, ago? it's fine. Well, I, I don't care about the time anymore. <laughs> Sweet. Um, so I do have, I know of at least one listener, um, Jade, who I've, she's probably the person I've shouted out the most to um, because she emails me regularly. Um, I know that she's interested in starting a podcast or was previously. Um and I, I do know of someone else, but I, I can't remember their name off the top of my head. So um, when when I when I found out that you were releasing a podcast, I had very conflicting emotions about that. <laughs> I was like, oh, now I'm not going to be the only one. That sucks. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, I think it's fantastic. I think it's great to to get um, as much as much voice and as much uh, marketing and exposure to the birding community out there as we can. Um, and each of us, like you have your circle of people and influence that you know, and I have mine and, and, um, if she was to start one up, she would have her own, you know, it's like, I, I probably, you and I would not have many people that we know that are in common. I wouldn't think so, you know, I think, um, having more voices out there doesn't necessarily detract from everybody else's uh anyway that's off topic that's not what the question is so uh what is my advice if you want to start a birding podcast i'm interested to know what your advice is after this but um so i will uh i have i have taken i did some notes on this um my first advice uh and also going back to what i said before this is just my advice i'm not comparing to your podcast or putting down however you've done it. This is just my advice. Um, when you start, start with the best quality gear that you can. Um, figure out what you can afford. Some people can't afford. Um, so the stuff that I got, so uh, this microphone and the I can't, the interface box and these headphones um, probably cost me about $700 all up to start with. So, that's not a budget that everybody has to put into something that doesn't return anything. Mm. Um, but in saying that people do like good quality sound, they, you're going to get people listen for longer if it sounds better. That's yeah. just, it's just a fact. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you what you should buy. Uh, this stuff works for me, but it's like, Canon versus Nikon, everyone has their preference. Uh, they both do the same thing, really, at the end of the day. Um, so you could you could probably you could get set up for a couple hundred bucks if you if you wanted to fairly easily. Um, so this is this is not just all about hardware, but I'm working my way through my advice. Um, headphones, I would say to start with, headphones are they're probably not essential. But um, it certainly helps. So these ones are noise cancelling. So uh, it cuts out all the noise outside of what comes into this microphone, which is very helpful, especially if you have children, because if I can hear the kids in my ears, then they are being recorded on my podcast. So then I can just, you know, turn down the gain and, and pick up less, less sound. So headphones are good. Um, I would suggest noise cancelling ones if you can afford them, but they're much more expensive than just standard ones. Um, so outside of hardware, once you once you decide that you're going to get into it, and you obviously have once you've spent multiple hundreds of dollars on your equipment, um, my advice would be pick your audience. So, from so you can't be everything to everybody. If you try and if you try and create a podcast that is attractive to 7 billion people, <laughs> you're not going to be focused enough to be interesting to the people you want to reach. So um, my advice is pick your audience and create a single person. Sorry, I keep playing around. This is the peg. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps flashing up randomly. I'll put that down, distracting. <laughs> um, uh, create your audience into a single person, whether that is like, a 35-year-old male who is a twitcher or whether that is like a 60-year-old female who is an international birder interested in Australia. Because if you're, if you're targeting people not in Australia and 
trying to into um, not integrate, but trying to teach them about Australian birds, you're going to produce very different interviews and interview very different people and talk very differently about Australian birds and Australian locations than you are to someone who is an Australian twitcher. Yes. They're not going to be interested necessarily in the same conversations. Um, so for interest's sake, my listener that I created was just me. I was like, I am the person that I'm trying to reach. So, and that helps in a number of different ways. I know exactly what I'm interested in. So if we're talking mid-conversation and uh, they just mention briefly something, if I'm interested to know what that was, I'll go down that path. And if I'm not, I'll just leave it. And I don't have to think, are the people that I'm trying to reach going to be interested in that or are they not? Um, so, yeah, so uh, create your audience. Decide who it is that you're targeting because you can't target everybody. Um, that's, that's one piece of advice. Um, you need to be ready to accommodate things. So, for example, I interviewed um, John Young. We talked about his night parrot discovery. And we could not get Zoom to work. And everything that I had done up to that point, and this was very recently, I think his was like episode 46 or something. Um, up until that point, everything was on Zoom. So I knew what was happening. I knew how it was done. I, I didn't have to think about it. Um, I'd already made all of the mistakes that I would thought that I would make. Uh, when I interviewed Adrian Walsh, we talked about the Nordman's green shank. Um, I forgot to press record. And we oh, did the whole no. interview. Did you really? <laughs> we did the whole interview and he left. And then I pressed end meeting and I just oh, shut down. No. <laughs> so, you know, and then I had to ring him back and I was like, oh, I'm so sorry, but we have to do that again. Um, anyway, so I'd, I'd already made all the mistakes, but we could not get Zoom to work. We tried this way. We tried him calling in on his phone. We tried Skype. We tried. <laughs> everything we could and in and in the end i just got my phone my mobile and he rang it and i put it on speakerphone and i just taped it to the microphone <laughs> and we just had we just had a speaker conversation because for that conversation i figured in, people were interested enough in it that the audio quality didn't really matter um and the audio quality was significantly worse than i would prefer but um that conversation is now my second most downloaded one. So wow. you, need, you, need, you need to be willing to accommodate and change and do whatever it takes to make it happen. Um, I've also had, uh, I've also had a, um, I want to say client. Client's not the word. That's tour, <laughs> tour guiding. I had a, what's the word that I'm looking for? Someone I interviewed on my podcast. A guest, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I had a guest on um, and we did, the we did the conversation and they emailed me back the next day and said, look, I, I, I think I said like 20% of what I wanted to say. Um, I really don't think I did a very good job. Could we do it again? And so right. we just did it again. That's good. Um, yeah, yeah. And it, and, it was, and it was really good the second time around. It was definitely worth doing again. Um, and what else have I got in here? So I've got two other, two other um, pointers. One is don't be too hard on yourself. Uh, people will give you criticism. Some will be useful. Don't ignore that. Um, you want to be better. You want to get better at what you do. Um, others will just want to complain. My advice is you just ignore them. Um, so I'm, uh, as an example, I'm an elected member of our local council. Um, and so if you think podcasting gives you criticism, um, <laughs> being, on, <laughs> being on council will do it. Anyway, um, so there's always people criticizing. There's always people saying you should have done this, should have done that. Why do you do this? Why do you not do that? Um, but if you ever were going to suggest, well, maybe since you have such strong opinions, you could run for council next election, or since you have such strong opinions, maybe you could start a birding podcast. People suddenly become much less interested at that point. Um, so criticisms will come. They might not be verbal or written an email, they might just be someone gives your podcast like a two-star rating. You know, it could be something like that. But at least you're giving something back to the birding community. Yeah. So 
you know, just don't be too hard on yourself. Just do what you can and enjoy your time. Enjoy it. It's it's genuinely good fun. It genuinely is good fun. Um, and the only other piece of advice that I wrote down was just be willing to adapt. Don't think that what you have is like a concrete recipe for success. So, um, for example, when I started doing episodes, I would put an introduction in about what birding I had done in the last two weeks. Um, and then because my interview started taking longer and longer, you know, like an hour, hour and 15, I cut that out and I had a number of people email me back and say, look, we're, we're, we want to know what birding you've done. Like, really? That's, oh, cool. We find that interesting. We, we would rather listen to something that was 10 minutes longer and hear that than not. So, so I changed back. So just be, be flexible, listen to what people want. Um, because at the end of the day, you're not really there for you. You're there for the people listening to give them what they want to listen to. Um, so be flexible. Um, and I think, I think that's probably the main advice that I have. Um, oh no, the other one, which I was thinking of just before we started this conversation was don't, um, don't limit yourself. So I did a, I did a conversation with, um, I uh, can't remember his name. He wrote this book. What's his name? Oh, uh, jo uh, Joseph Deloyal. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, man. So, that was incredible. Incredible. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I, I did an interview with him and it was a fantastic episode. And I did an interview with Peter Harrison who did the Seabirds, the new Seabirds book. And that was um, incredible. And, but you don't have to be, in, like you don't have to be famous to get these people. I literally just went onto the links Facebook page and just sent them a message and said, I'm interested in interviewing these guys. And they directed me to where to go. And I sent an email and they're like, yeah, let's do it. So yeah, incredible. Yeah. So it's, it's not, um, if you think of someone to ask, just ask. The worst they can say is no. I recently, um, I'll just put this out there. <laughs> I recently sent an email to David Attenborough, actually, to his <gasps> manager. Wow. And said, just, just interested, <laughs> you know, be fantastic. And he said, he came back and he said, no, sorry, he's not interested in doing that sort of thing. But that's the worst that can happen. Like, yeah, wow. You no. Know, they just say no. And you're like, okay, fair enough. Like, I wasn't honestly expecting this to happen. So no skin off my back. But yeah, if you do get into podcasting and you find someone you want to interview, just reach out. Just yeah. ask them. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. and get them on. The more, the more, uh, the more people we have involved and interested and actively talking about Australian burning, the better. For so sure. That's my advice. What's Incredible. your what's your advice? Do you have anything to add to that? Well, there's, there's so, there's, there's <laughs> Can so I much ask to, the question? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, there's so much to unpack in that. Like, just, 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 just one that's fresh in my mind. Um, I've been a huge uh, fan of Joseph Del Hoyo for 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 in, ever since I was I was you know old enough to remember stuff like because my, yep. my dad my dad had all the handbook of the birds of the world the big the big yep. red books and yep. I, and, I, and his name was on each of them and I was like wow what a legend you know like and and I actually did email I emailed him when I was like how old was would I've been oh, I don't know you know maybe 10 11 12 and yep. I I actually emailed him and asked him for advice on how to how to film birds and he emailed back and he said, hey, Guillaume, here's, 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 you know, <laughs> here's some advice. And I was blown away. I was like, wow, what a, what, yeah. a kind, what a kind and thoughtful man to email back a 12-year-old about how to film birds. And, yeah. and when I first found out your podcast, I saw his name. I was like, wow, he, he, he got Joseph Deloyo on. That's incredible. And uh, kudos to him. He must have really worked for that. But, but, but you just kind of went on and asked. That's incredible. And and another thing that's related to that is the lack of birding podcasts actually works to our advantage in that sense, yeah. you know, and say, yeah. oh, you know, <laughs> there's so few podcasts about birding that the chances are if you ask a huge, super famous birder or ornithologist yeah. or naturalist, that they will say, oh, that's interesting, a podcast about this. So yeah. That doesn't happen often. I'll, I'll, I'll say yes yeah. to this. Um, and even, even if he had... He even if he had been on like every single birding podcast in the world, it's probably like 15. <laughs> you know, it's, not, it's not like he's done an interview a day for like the last two years. Um, but yeah, I mean, so, like I, I don't remember how it took me a little while to get him on. Like it was a fair few emails and changing and doing this, but I mean, it wasn't hard work. It was just 
talking yeah. to the right people. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it, it, it just takes time, I suppose. And, and there are some guests that do yeah. take a bit longer. Um, uh, ever since, I think it was, yeah, in October or November last year, I, I emailed Rowan Clark, if you wanted to come on, and he... Oh, yes. He, um, who you've had on your show, and um, and he replied back saying, yeah, that sounds fun, let's do it. But he just, he's just so busy, and the time's never really... Yeah. I still hope to have him on at one point, so hi, Rowan, if you're listening. Uh, I'm really keen to have you on. <laughs> But it is, it does take time. Um, but in terms of my advice, uh, let's, I'll go back to the beginning of, of where you started with hardware. Um, so so the, the way I started is, and I, I told you this at the beginning, is I just have a clip-on microphone here. And I connect it to my phone, and I, I, and I record my, my audio on my phone separately from the Zoom call. Um, and, and and I find that I find that it's worked pretty well, and the audio is surprising. I surprised myself when I first heard it back. It's like, oh, it's actually quite quite a good, level of production um, for what it costs, 14 bucks on eBay for two, for two clip-on mics. Um, and, and I would say if, you're, if you want to explore, if anyone listening wants to explore podcast, podcasting and maybe try it out, maybe that would be a good start, um, you know, and, 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 and a low-cost way of, of, of starting up. Um, mm. Because I, I didn't have the budget back then to, to, to invest in, 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 a, in a better microphone, um, but I am thinking of, of, of getting a setup similar to yours soon um but 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 yeah h hardware is important and good audio sound is so important man it's it's like sometimes like yeah when i listen to, to podcasts um I, I am put off by bad audio it's like ah oh, they couldn't they have done a better job at getting better sound quality so so that that is a big a big point um and and but but the biggest piece of advice i can give is is more general and perhaps more more related to birds themselves if you love birds if you really love birds then you're not going to have a problem talking about birds, right? Yeah, yeah. And 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 that's the that's the drive. That's what's going to carry the whole podcast along is your love and your passion for birds and 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 the joy that birds bring, which is my, the theme for my podcast. Is the central core of the podcast is the joy of birding. What brings you joy about birding? And yeah, and and, and in a sense, I, I get the feeling that. Um, you can get a variety of guests, but but the, the the tone of your podcast is important. I I quite like to keep my podcast quite informal and and fun and conversational, um, because I think that's it's it's pleasant to listen to, um, and people can relate to that. But I, I would be thrilled if anyone <laughs> came off from listening to this and said, you know what, I'm going to start a burning podcast. I'm going to do it, and then I'm I'm going to email both these guys and say, hey, you guys. Uh, <laughs> Encourage me. It would be beautiful, and I hope it happens. But, yeah, it um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Any more thoughts on that? Uh, <laughs> no, not particularly. But I'm, if anyone emails me asking for advice, I'm happy to give it. Uh, this is not a not an exclusive club. If you want to join the bird watching podcasters club, join in. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and same goes for me. You can email me birdingtoday at gmail.com uh, with, with whatever you want. And, you know, and we could even do a three way, a three way special one day with the, just three podcasters or four, you know, who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah. But so that so that's podcasting. It's it's a beautiful form of, of, of communication. And and I hope it grows, you know, and and it's really kind of a privilege to be part of the the few in Australia. Um, and and I hope that we are joined by more. Um, yeah. And, you know, and, and I think it's really, really great. But I, I think there is something in what I said at the beginning that birders are just always so keen to get outside and go birding that, yeah. that they can't dedicate much time to other... Because podcasting in itself, you could argue, is, is a hobby apart from birding, isn't it? Because yeah. you have the, yeah. the, te the technical aspect and you have the, 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 the aspect of editing and, uh, and, and hosting, there's, there, there is something apart from birding, but it's the marriage of, of podcasting and birding that really gets me, gets me going. So I'm, I'm, and, I'm, and it's the same for you, I'm sure. So it's, it's really something. Yeah, and that, that's right. There's, apart from the topic you're talking about, there's really not much similar to birding in podcasting. You're inside, you're doing audio recording and, and you know, technical stuff. It's, it's not birding. It's not birding. But... I think what it brings to birding is beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. And let, let's so let's let's go on. And unless you have um, any more thoughts, I've lost my notes. Uh, but unless you have any more <laughs> thoughts on, um, oh, oh, here it is. Um, if you, unless you have any more thoughts on that, we can move to to to, to, to birding itself. Um, yep, which, no, that's all good. Let's move on. Let's move that's on. Um, so I know that you you've birded overseas 
a lot extensively. And um, I'm interested in in finding out. Well, I I already know, but for our listeners, what's your what's your favorite <laughs> your favorite international brooding experience? Tell us about that. So, um, a little bit of background to this uh, to this experience. Um, and if this is all taking too long, you're welcome to just cut it out. Uh, so, I, I worked in Uganda for um, a little while back before I was married. So I've been married um, seven and a half years now. Um, before that, I worked in Uganda, but I didn't do any um, sightseeing. I literally just worked. Um, and I'd always wanted to go back and, you know, do the mountain gorilla trek and just go birding and all of that sort of stuff. So my wife uh, grew up in South Africa, moved out to Australia when she was 10. Um, so when we got married, uh, we did a, a four-week honeymoon to Africa. We did two weeks in South Africa with her family um, and then two weeks in Uganda doing all the stuff that I wanted to do when I was there. Um, and I love Uganda. I, I really do enjoy it and spectacular birding um but my favorite international birding experience was in uganda we were at the queen elizabeth i think it's the queen elizabeth the second national park i don't think it's queen elizabeth national park you know what it's all the same i think there's only one in uganda um and we were there i'd taken my camera uh, so i could take photos because i you know i wasn't well versed in african birds to the extent that i'm australian if i see if i see this little brown thing on the side of the road i'm not going to know what it is um so i took my camera along and i'm very glad that i was because essentially i just took photos of everything that we saw and um we had a guide with us he wasn't a bird guide specifically but we had just hired him for like two weeks to drive us around um so he was our driver had a car or like a you know van um, and so we went to Queen Elizabeth National Park for six hours. We got there at like sunrise and we had to be elsewhere after lunch. So we were there for six hours and I got 126 lifers in that <laughs> six hours, which is like, which is like a lifer every two and a half minutes for wow. six hours. It was oh. insane. Um, and I literally couldn't even keep up. I was so glad I took my camera. Otherwise I would have come back with like, 10 lifers. Wow. <laughs> Fabulous. Like, wow. That one, that one, that one. And it was spectacular. We saw um, we saw a leopard. Uh, we saw lions chasing buffalo. We saw hippos galore. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, just so many birds. So many birds. Um, I'm trying to think of any standout ones. There were widow birds. Um, oh, wow. Marsh- Marshall eagle. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. What's the? It's like an African eagle with a very short tail. Um, the battler. Anyway. Is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Um, and heaps of vultures, and it was just spectacular. It was like probably the greatest six hours of birding I've ever done in my life. Um, so, highly recommend that if you're ever in Uganda. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 so why? Just, just, just briefly, why did you choose Uganda to go? Like initially, um, for work. Um, yeah, so I was uh, I was working in New Zealand uh, at a whitewater rafting lodge there. I was the head chef. It was sort of it was focused on whitewater rafting, but we had various different accommodations around the place. Um, and so I was wrapping up my contract there, and my boss was friends with a guy who had just opened a lodge in Uganda. It's like built on the built on an island in the middle of the Nile. Um, and he was looking for someone to come and train his chefs. I think they've been open for like six months. Train the chefs there how to cook non-Ugandan traditional food, essentially. Um, it's pretty expensive. It was pretty expensive to stay there. So it was fairly, you know, high class stuff. So they were looking for someone to come and put a bit of Western flavor into the wow. into the menu. So, um, so, yeah, he just, I was standing at the bar in one of my last weeks of work. And he said, I've got a job in Uganda if you're interested. And I said, yeah, I'll take it. And then uh, three weeks wow. later, I was over there. Yeah, that's amazing. Just birding in a new place, that's that's a topic I touch on a lot in the in, in the podcast. And 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 because because it's so it's so um universal the feeling of going somewhere new and just seeing all these yeah. crazy new you know, not even new families, but new orders of birds sometimes. Yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> birds you're like you're like, I don't even I don't even know where to start with what that bird is. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> I got no idea. Yeah, yeah, that that yeah. must have been incredible. And um, and, and and I know that when you you you, you wrote to me um. Just before we started uh, doing this, up until now, the the uh, the aspect of bird photography in, in in your birding journey, you say that you you told me that you that you love bird photography. Um, so so tell me about how you use bird photography when birding. That's that, I really get interested in that. So yeah, so I love um, I love photography. There's my camera over there. Nice. Over there. Yep. <laughs> Can't go backwards with my finger. Um, yeah. So. Um, I really enjoy photography, just in general, um, but specifically bird photography. However, since uh, since I've taken up tour guiding, um, it's sort of taken a back seat because it's very hard. And I know there, I know some guides um, are good at it, um, and I know there's a lot of tours that are sort of photography based, so that makes it a lot easier. But um, for me, I'm I don't want to spend time trying to get a photo myself when I feel like I should be trying to get my clients better views of this bird or get them in a position for good photos or, um, you know, yeah, I feel like it just takes away from the experience a little bit. So I do lug my camera around everywhere. So this is an interesting story, which isn't in my notes. Um, I do lug my camera around everywhere, specifically if I find a bird that no one's going to believe that I saw. So, um, you know, I just take a photo and be like, there you go. However, uh, the one time so far that that would have been useful, I left my camera in the car. So <laughs> oh, no, um, we were on a tour. For those who listen to my podcast would know this story, but um, I was on a tour out near Uluru at uh, the end of last year. And we, one of, one of my clients had to stay back uh, in his hotel room to try and book flights because he was like, it was in the middle of when you could get into Western Australia and then you couldn't and he was trying to get into WA so he was trying to figure out flights on how he could get through the border. Um, and so the rest of us went for a drive. We went about 50 kilometres, I think, east of Uluru, just picked a random spot on the side of the road um, and just walked out looking. Um, and I ran up to the top of this sand dune to try and see where we were and what what might be a good spot to go and look at. And a flock of princess parrots flew over my head <sighs> just in the middle of nowhere, absolute middle of nowhere. And I watched them to see where they would go. And it, I couldn't really tell because they flew behind a sand dune. But yeah. um, the, the one guy that would have genuinely been interested in running out there to find them was sitting back in his hotel room, 50 kilometres back in the other direction. So we, we drove back, we picked him up. Uh, we came back, so it was like two hours later, um, and we're both of it. So we were we were probably the serious birders in the group. The other guys were not as not as serious. Um, and uh, what was that? You anyway, know, so we came back. It was about two hours later, and we're like, "Look, there's they're probably like two hundred kilometers away by now." They were. Oh. I saw them when they were flying. It's pretty unlikely that we're going. In fact, there's almost zero chance that we're going to see them. Anyway, we're like, well, we're going to be out here for like nine hours. Like we can't, you can't give up an opportunity to find princess parrots. So um, anyway, so I left my camera because I didn't want to lug that thing. It weighs about three kilos. Didn't want to lug that up and down sand dunes all day long. And then about 40 minutes later, we stumbled on a group of four princess parrots just flying along the base of the sand dune yeah. underneath us. And I couldn't get any photos because I didn't have my camera. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Man, anyway, so. that's so frustrating but, when that happens, isn't it? Oh, you know that's so. That's... The one time, the the one time it would have been useful to have my camera because I saw something good, I didn't have it. But anyway, so when I'm at home, um, I like photograph, I like bird photography. Uh, when I'm just birding on my own, I quite enjoy it. Uh, my big problem is that I have like this character flaw, this major character flaw, where I only like the best things <laughs> so and i i just can't afford them so i'm always like semi upset with my camera setup because it's only worth like three thousand dollars instead of 30 but that's okay <laughs> that's my own problem <laughs> oh but man yeah just just, just 
t touching on that and discussing photography is so like inverting. It's like, but but in the end, you 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 have to cherish that the, that you saw them and the and the, it's 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 it's, it's uh, what's the word? It's uh, it's carved in your memory that experience. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That, that must have been great, man. And uh, and and when you're out guiding like that, this was another question that I had. That I'm interested. Um, in, in in tour guiding, what what do you think makes a good tour guide? Um, that's a that's a question that probably has a lot of different facets to it. Um, so I feel very very fortunate to have this job. So when I was, um, I remember this. It was about ten years ago. I was at a at one of these. Uh, horrendous like team building exercise things <laughs> <laughs> nobody likes to do i read a study once actually that team building exercises do nothing except make eat, everybody hate each other more. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway so uh i remember this time because it was the first time that i ever said out loud that my dream job was to be a bird watching tour guide um because one of the questions was what was what what would you do if you could do anything it was about 10 years ago and I, I never did anything about it because, I mean, you know, that's not a thing you can do, really. Uh, and then I just sort of absolutely just fell into it, just luck. Um, and I love it. It's just the greatest, it's just the greatest job in the world. Um, and I mean, you're not, it's not like just going birding in your local wetland. Like you are working. People have paid you good money to find these birds. Um, but, you know, like if I'm ever watching the sunrise over Uluru or, traipsing through like some insanely remote lignum swamp chasing gray grass fens. I'm like, this is just insane that I'm being paid to do this. Um, <laughs> so I love it. It's, it's just the greatest job in the world. However, back to your question. Sorry. I keep, I keep, uh, <clears throat> I keep jumping off of what you actually asked me and oh, I love going it. On it's great. I do. <laughs> um, anyway, so what makes a good tour guide? You have to be good with people. So you might be a bird watching tour guide, but I would say, birding itself is is less than half of the job you wow. have to be good with people mm. um so uh you get people who are very good about birding and they're like you know that's just birding sometimes they just don't show up you know some days you have you know like um uh so you might have you might have a client who might book in three months in advance and that's the only free day they have like in australia sometimes you get people who fly into adelaide for a conference they've got one free day in the middle and they want to go birding and it's like 10 degrees raining and howling a gale and so you have to like do the best you can with that situation and you can't change it there's nothing there's nothing you can you can't move the date or anything like that um and some people are very good about that and some people are you know, I paid good money to see birds. I expect to see what I want to see. So you got to be able to deal with different people like that. Um, you uh, you need to be able to deal with stressful situations. Um, luckily, I've never had anything like that yet. So uh, probably the most stressful situation I've had is just flat tires, I think. Mm. Um, but that's okay. Uh it would be more stressful if I got two flat tires, um, which is entirely possible on the Birdsville track or whatever. Um, but in saying that, you also have to be very good at finding birds. So I, I don't want to... Um, I'm, a, I'm quite an unassuming sort of person. So this... this you know, I'm a bit uncomfortable saying this, but I, I'll just say it anyway because it has to be said. Um, you have to be good at finding birds. So just because somebody gives you directions to a spot to find something doesn't mean they're going to be within five meters of that location. Um, so I'll give you an example. We were, um, I had a private tour. We were chasing chestnut breasted whiteface, which are difficult to find at the best of times. Um, in fact, one of my least chestnut breasted whiteface and gray honey eater are my two least favorite birds for people to say they want to find. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a, we have a tour that I do which is called the grey honey eater and chestnut breasted white face <laughs> tour. So, <laughs> so that's good. Um, anyway, we'll, we were trying to find these and we dipped on a spot um, on the highway, Sturt Highway, Stuart Highway, can't remember which one, um, on the highway. And we weren't going far enough north to Coober Pedy to try there where they're a bit more regular, a bit easier to find. 
And we were just driving along the highway, heading to a spot looking for something else, grass wrens or something. And we just drove past a spot. And I thought, if I was a chestnut-breasted whiteface, that's where I'd be. That's, that's the sort of spot I like. So we turned around, drove back you know, 500 metres, pulled off the side of the road, drove out. Um, there was a track, drove out, I don't know, a little way. Got out of the car and I played the call just to quickly see if anything was around. And one flew in and landed within about three metres of us, wow. so close that my camera, my camera couldn't even focus on it. It was like you could have literally jumped and grabbed it. And uh, that was just insane. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. I mean, you've got to have the intuition, isn't it? That like your intuition is is the foundation of the success of that birding experience. Like your intuition, are oh, they I feel like they would be there. And they were. And so I'm not saying that um I'm the only person who can do that. I mean, but um I've looked for I've looked for them enough times that, you know, if I see a spot that I think they would like, I I just feel like that would be a good spot. And and similarly, uh, interesting, this is another white face story. Maybe I'm only good at finding white faces, but um, we were up the Birdsville track and I hope you don't mind me telling stories. Go uh, for it. Go for it. We were up the, we're up the Birdsville track and the weather had been absolutely horrendous. We hadn't seen anything all morning. It was hot. It was blowing a gale. Uh, we'd stopped to try and scope some birds in the distance and it was so much sand getting blown around. We couldn't open our eyes long enough to look in the scope. So we knocked off for about three hours and then headed out about three hours later. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon. So we only had like four hours before sunset and we had an absolutely killer afternoon. We, in those four hours, we'd found um, some gibber birds, some grey falcons, inland dotrels. Uh, we found a family of thick-billed grass wren. And then we had about 30 minutes left before sunset and we decided to try for Aryan grass wren. And like 20 minutes later, we found Aryan grass wren. <laughs> And uh, so we just had like an awesome afternoon. But in all of that excitement, I'd forgotten to check a banded whiteface site. We're very reliable. Um, and that was the last spot on the trip that we were going to find banded whiteface. And we couldn't, go, we didn't have time to go back in the morning. So I was like, oh, that sucks. Anyway, the next morning we're driving along. We're about 60 kilometers north. We passed the spot and I was like, I bet you there's banded whiteface in that spot. That looks like a banded whiteface spot. So we pulled over, we walked around for about 10 minutes and found a pair of banded whiteface floating around in the oh. trees. So, yeah, I, I, I really don't want to blow my trumpet too much, but <laughs> the, the point is, the point is you have to be good at finding birds. You have to, you can't just be like, oh, someone gave me a GPS point. I'm going to go there and find this bird. You have to, you have to be able to understand how birds think. Like, what is it about this this location that this bird likes um yeah so yeah yeah um, Eco ecologically speaking as well like the the, the habitat itself and, and understanding all the the different uh, bio connections between the landscape and the birds and the species and yeah you gotta you gotta kind of have a complete vision of what the bird is about not only about the bird but its habitat too yeah yeah, yeah 100 percent for sure um so yes i'll i'll stop there because i I'm aware we've taken a long time on this podcast, <laughs> which is fine with me. I'm not in any hurry, but um, <laughs> but that's fine. I don't know like, how long uh, people want to listen to me chat for. <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to touch on that actually. To, looping back to um, to what we were talking about, the you know in in the main segment of the of, of the podcast, which was about podcasting. Like yes, when I first started out, I was like. I was always, my eyes were always darting to the clock. Okay, okay, I've got to keep a time limit, 45 minutes. Okay, uh, yep. let, let's wrap up. Um, uh, yep. and, th and that continued maybe until towards the end of the first season. Uh, and maybe a little bit into the second season. Um, and actually we can talk about how, how different podcasts have seasons and others don't. That's an interesting point. Um, mm. But, but, but what, I, what I'm getting at is that I've stopped worrying about the time limit. And I've also become more confident as a host. If you go back and watch or listen to my second, uh, my, my first episode, it's like you can tell I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm kind of jittering, like, oh, am I doing this right? Hey, uh, I, yeah. I think I did a good job, but, but, but I did improve. And, and for anyone listening who wants to start hosting a, a burning podcast, you do improve over time. So don't expect the first three, five or, or six episodes to, to be, to be yeah. perfect. But then the quality yeah. and, and your confidence does improve. And I'm sure you found that with your, with your work as well. Yeah, hundred percent. I I can barely listen to my first two or three. <laughs> it's so just cringeworthy. I mean, they're not bad. Like if you listen to them, 
not as yourself. Everybody says, oh, no, they're fine. They're like, you know, perfectly fine. But for me, I'm like, oh, I was so nervous and just, you yeah, know, it, it definitely gets better and you get more confident. Like, um, so a quick anecdote there. Um, yeah, it used to take me probably two or three hours to um, edit an episode, but now it takes me 10 minutes. Like I, I really don't edit anything we talk about unless, you know, like someone has to get up and go to the toilet or, you know, like properly edit something. I just record my intro, chuckle on the front and release it. So, and that just comes from practice. That just comes from doing it 20 times and just being able to know what works and what doesn't. Yeah, for sure. No, you get better in all the aspects in your own confidence and while you're recording and also in the post-production and and, and, yep. and the, promo the promotion as well as another aspect of, of podcasting, which I... I maybe could improve a bit on. I just I just chuck it on Facebook and that's it really and I forget about it. Do you do anything more than that for promotion? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, nope. I put it on I put it on Facebook. Uh I do have an Instagram page which I sort of use on and off. Um but yeah, no, nah, probably about the same. Right. No, for sure, for sure. But yeah, I wanted to touch on that and maybe we can um, we can also touch on what I just said about seasons and stuff because that's a, a big difference that listeners will notice about, you know, between my podcast and yours. Um, yeah. Because I, I first thought about, I, th I thought, because I was aware it was going to take time. And I thought maybe, uh, and there's so much to talk about and, and maybe we should start wrapping up, but, but also like batch recording episodes. <laughs> nah, that's like, fine. Just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, if we have any listeners left, <laughs> if we have any listeners left, thanks for being here. Um, but what I'm trying to get at is... If, First, about seasons. Did did you consider making maybe a seasonal podcast, uh, or did were you always just going to release them as they came out, the episodes? Uh, yeah, I I did consider it. Um, it was a long time ago. I don't remember what my thoughts were, but um, essentially, I just just decided I was just going to release them as they mm. came. So when I first started, I think my first maybe twenty were like weekly ones, uh, but that just became too much work. Um, trying to fit in around other stuff as well. So then I turned to fortnightly. Um, and for those who listen to my podcast would know, and as you know, I've just um, had to change all of that again. So now, now it's just whenever I can find time, um, which is like the cardinal sin of podcasting. They're like, you have to be regular. Your, your people, your listeners expect every week, every fortnight, same time, same day, an episode. So I'm ignoring that um, and hopefully it will come back to that. But yeah, no, I, um, I did consider seasons, but for me, yeah, I just decided not to basically. Yeah. Just release yeah. them as they come out. I, I, and I thought about releasing them as well because I really like how you have the, the, the episode number on, on each of your episodes. Like I can't do that really because it's, it's, it's seasonal. So I do, yeah. you know, S1, E1 and then S3, yeah. E, E7. Um, but I think that works for me personally because I, I batch record all of the episodes, and that's that that does have disadvantages because the the the, the episodes get outdated, and by the time they're out, it's like it's already a month old. Like, yeah, and that's a thing to consider. But but it, it is useful in in the, in the production, which means you record a whole bunch of episodes, and then all you have to do is is just edit them and schedule them, upload them and schedule them for release. And then it makes it kind of smoother. But, but I do like having seasons because it, then it gives me a break. And, I, and you know, when you, let, when you let listeners know, all right, this is the end of season two. I'll be back for season three after a break. Um, but yeah, there's so many ways to do it. Like there's so many ways that you can do it. Yeah. yeah and there's no right or wrong. You just, whatever yeah. works for you. Yeah. I think we should start wrapping up now um, with with the closing <laughs> with the closing questions. This is going to be the longest episode to date, and I'm so happy that it is because it's it's so much to unpack and it's a bit of a special episode. So, um, thanks to you, Michael, again for 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 your time and stuff. It's really good. Um, it's been good. So, the age old question. I don't even need to ask it. Really, what's your favorite bird? <laughs> so, um, so I. So let me let me answer this in a number of ways. Um, <laughs> so my favorite bird versus um, my dream bird. So yeah, uh, my favorite bird. You probably think I'm going to say princess parrot, but I'm not going to say princess parrot. My my favorite bird is black grass wren. So 
Um, I don't know if you've ever seen Black Grass Run or not. No. So we did a big um, camping trip across the Gibb River Road, across the Kimberley when I was, uh, when my eldest son was six months old. So four and a half, four years ago. Um, and so we, we drove up there, spectacular trip, just a brilliant trip. And uh, I really wanted to find Black Grass Run. That was my, that was my key target for the whole trip. Um, and I went up there in the morning on the, on Little Merton Falls, I think, behind there. And I searched and searched and searched for hours and I didn't find anything. And I was so annoyed about it because that was the only shot I was going to get. Um, and then just as I was, like I'd literally decided to give up and was walking back to the our campsite and a pair of them popped up just on my left-hand side. And it was, they'd just, I think they're the bird that their drawings do the least amount of justice to. Wow. Like they're okay. just so much more spectacular than the drawings. Um, and yeah, so that was my favorite bird. Um, the, the princess parrot was my favorite Australian birding experience. Uh, but yes, my favorite bird, black grass ring. Um, my dream bird, as in birds that I would like to see, um, I have I have a lot. Um, I'd like to see a black beard, a Cuban toddy, a bearded vulture, standard wing nightjar, et cetera, et cetera. But um, so this, we talked about this uh, earlier about the guy that I said you really had to listen to the podcast in his voice um, was Vernon Head. I have his book here. It's holding up my computer screen. So I interviewed him about this book, The Search for what? the Rarest Bird in the World. Wow, yeah. Um, and he was the most passionate person I've ever spoken to about birding. Um, I, sorry for plugging my own podcast on yours, but um, <laughs> if, I, <laughs> I would really recommend listening to his, his episode. It was just spectacular. Anyway, so uh, this book is about um, the Nitchasar, I think you call it, Nitchasar, Nightjar. Um, that's probably my dream bird now after that episode to try and to try and find one of them, um, which is it's a whole nother level of stuff, but you have to listen to the podcast or read the book. Definitely read the book. Anyway, that's my um, favorite bird and dream bird. What's yours? Can I ask, can I ask what's your um, favorite and dream bird is? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'm put on the spot now. Um, it just, it's too hard for me to say, really. Um, well, I've, I've actually, as it happens, um, last Sunday, two days ago, I went on a pelagic. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, from Southwest Rocks on the mid north coast in New South Wales. Um, uh, Liam Murphy organizes them, and he does a great job at yep. doing that. Um, and and it, if anyone listening is, is thinking about going on them, go. It's really, really cool. We saw um, uh, the highlight for me, j just because of the, the moment uh, that it appeared, was the Tahiti petrel. That came just ah oh, yes. oh, white belly just kind of ah oh, just and, and and it was raining quite hard, um, and it was choppy waters and then a tidy petrol. Uh, which one is it? Which one? Is it? <laughs> and uh, and for the moment, but for me, I, I think I can fairly say that for me, I don't have a permanent favorite bird. I I just I get too affected by the experience of 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 regular birding that it. <laughs> You know, it always changes, and 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 like two days ago, like oh, and and it's and the TD petrel has quite a quite a thick beak, quite a big beak, and uh, and and just the way it appeared out of the you know from under a wave, and just God, absolutely gorgeous. I just and and the name Tahiti petrel, so exotic. I don't know. That's for me. Yeah. That's that's what comes yeah. to mind now. And and yeah, nice. and and I don't even. I just want to quickly mention that I. Uh, I, I'm really quite bad with with seabirds, and I need to improve the, all the petrels. and And I wasn't even That's sure. Okay. And, I'm I'm with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I wasn't even sure which what it actually looked like the TD petrel because I hadn't done research um, on it before going to pelagic, and, and and I haven't gone on that many pelagics, and I, and I plan to because it's magical to go on pelagics. But but I was like I wasn't sure which one, and then and then one of the other people um, on the boat said they have white belly. It's like oh, and I saw it, fixed my eyes on it, and it's like. Oh, what that, those experiences are what what you live for, and pelagics yep. are, are are a very good source of those experiences. So Tahiti petrel is my is is my favorite bird at the moment, but it's probably going to change when yep. I get up to when I get up to Cairns in a, you know 
in a couple of days, I'll probably have a new one. But, um, yep. <laughs> but, but thank you so much for asking. It's very, very nice when the questions return. Um, <laughs> I'm not used I, to not asking the questions. <laughs> <laughs> and and so to, to to close the quest to close the the the, the show, um, which has been really really fun. Um, is there a destination in the whole world that if you only if if you could choose to go to one for birding, where would it be? That I have been or that I haven't been yet. Uh, let's go. Haven't been dream destination. So, um, if it was if it was the other way around, it would be Queen Elizabeth Park, Uganda. Right. Um, so, one of the one of the benefits of being a tour guide is you meet people who have been to a lot of places, um, and the most common answer that I get to this question because I like to ask people what they where the good places are to go. The most common answer is Colombia. Everybody says Colombia is the place to be. So before that, my question would have, my answer would have been um, anywhere in South America. Um, I would love to go to South America, Peru, Brazil, you know, anywhere around there. Um, but because I have birded a lot with a lot of people who have birded a lot, um, they say, Colombia is the place to go. So that's that's my answer. Columbia. Oh yeah, same. I'd love to go there. <laughs> I I lived in I listened as my listeners know I, I lived in Chile for a while. Um oh, yeah. and, and the numbers the numbers of birds in Chile is drastically lower than 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 other parts of South America because the, the, you don't have the Amazon and you don't have the tropical regions. Yeah. So 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 the diversity is a bit lower, but you still get the, the Chilean endemics, Chilean mockingbird, um uh, what's another endemic? Uh the the the, the tapaculos, um and and of course you get the, the Humboldt current, um, and and that that's a nice that's a nice spot. Um, but uh, but yeah, we we could just go on for hours, and and probably when we when I hit record, when I hit the, the stop record button, we can keep talking. But <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure, Michael. Thank you, and you've you've made the show, you've improved the show a lot, and I hope we've um, I hope we've also touched on the podcast issue. Uh, as completely as we can in order in order for people to be encouraged, and I really do hope. Uh, that when this episode is released, we we can see some fruits of that and see maybe a, a new, even if it's just one new birding podcast, I'd be so excited. So thanks for your time, man. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. And and I just want to I just want to say to wrap up. I know that uh, when we were talking about podcasts, that I said um, a few things about handling criticism and whatnot and whatever, but that is a, a, a very small minority. Like. Don't let that put you off. If you're like, oh, I'd like to start a podcast, but I really don't want to have people tell me that I'm doing a bad job. Like you might get one person every two years. It's not it's not worth not starting for. Um, so don't take that as a negative thing. But um, thank you very much for having me. It's been um, great fun. It's been fun being on the other end of the uh, interview and I uh, hope everybody listening finds it interesting. For sure. I hope so too. Um, likewise. So thank you, Michael. I'll see you soon. Happy birding and good luck. Thank you for listening to or watching this episode of the Birding Today podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to stay up to date with the show, you can follow me on all my social media platforms. And if you want to take it a step further and support the show and also get some cool benefits, you can support me on Patreon as well. So again, thank you for listening or watching and I'll see you in the next one.